Good morning. Welcome to Manifest Live. I'm not sure what to call it. I'm not live right now. I, I mean, I'm alive, but this is a pre-recorded uh, message. My name's Tom. I'm referring to my notes here, which I usually do on a Sunday morning. Uh, so you have to forgive me as I look down. My teleprompter is broken. Actually, she went downstairs to make sure that the kids stay quiet. Um, but yeah, response is a big part of what we love to do at Manifest. We try to get people to engage, to be participants in the service, not just observers. If you're watching this right now and you want to engage and respond and be part of it, there should be a way for you to do that. You can still chat and, uh, and ask questions, type it in. You should be able to type it in right here, right? Just type it in the part of your screen to, is it here? It's right there. Wherever it is, you can type in and uh, there will be people there to engage, uh, introduce yourself, uh, ask questions, and yeah, just be part of uh, church with us this morning as we are exploring this new way of trying to deliver God's message and uh, be a community of believers together. Uh, before I officially hand things over to our pastor, Brad, how is everyone doing in these uh, crazy times? This is... Uh, unprecedented, I think. Toilet paper is officially worth more than gold. People are realizing that before, you know what, I really wasn't spending nearly long enough washing my hands. We all really like to touch our faces. All of the school kids now are enjoying what will probably be referred to as the four month spring break of 2020. I'm sorry if I made any of the parents cry a little bit there. Like many of you, I'm now working from home full time, which is uh, a new experience. It sounded great at first. I thought, hey, I can wear whatever I want. I can sleep in more. I get an extra hour of sleep because I don't have to take the bus. I can visit with my family between Skype meetings. Uh, I can have movies playing in the background. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm an extrovert, which will probably surprise most of you. And I've discovered that not being able to interact with coworkers on a daily basis, not being able to have hallway conversations or shout something over the cubicle wall um, is, is actually having its toll on me. I'm, I'm uh, in my basement, in my den, attending my meetings via Skype and uh, talking to people, but not having that human you know, face-to-face -face interaction and it's starting to wear on me. I find at the end of the day, I'm really stressed. I feel kind of burdened. I think what I'm discovering is what most introverts already know. When they go to a, a loud party with lots of people, how I'm feeling at the end of the day is probably how introverts feel at that party. So introverts, I'm, I'm getting a small glimpse uh, of what things are like for you sometimes in those chaotic situations and uh, your need to be able to recharge alone and now me discovering my need to recharge with people. So um, introverts, you agree with that? Finally, the extroverts are getting a taste of it. You can nod quietly to yourselves in the comfort of your own home, unsurrounded by people. Um, anyway, if you are new to Manifest, welcome. Uh, we like to have fun. We like to laugh. Uh, we like to engage with one another. Hopefully, uh, I've made you smile a little bit, even if it's just at my goofy awkwardness and trying to figure out this new mechanism. It's kind of weird talking to a phone just standing on a tripod, but I'm imagining that you're all there and uh, I hope you're all engaging. Really glad to have you with us this morning, whether you're new to Manifest, whether you're new to Jesus, or you're a Manifest veteran, welcome. You belong here. Steve Martin said, you've got to laugh once a day because... A day without sunshine is like night. It's really profound. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm going to hand things over to Brad, which is to say he's going to hand it back to himself because he's controlling all of the video. I don't really have a say in that. Welcome to Manifest HD Tron uh, Cyber something. I don't know. We're still working on that. That a lot of you are scrambling to figure out this whole work-life balance, especially because for many of us, it's the same thing now. And so I want to offer you something in this unprecedented time where many of us are looking for stuff to do or you're, you've got more time at home because you're not commuting, that kind of thing. So I, a couple of years ago, wrote a book called Go With The Flow. Most of us, when we take our time with God, kind of rely on devotional books to do the work for us. I wrote a book that shows you how to build a quiet time from scratch 
There's never been a better time. So I wanna offer you this book free as a digital download, as a PDF. You can see that right there on the screen. And uh, there'll be links uh, also at the bottom of the video for that when we're all done this thing. So make sure you don't download. Hi boys and girls, I'm Mr. Steven. And you know what, it's kind of weird being here and, and not being with you, not seeing you. It's, it's kind of strange. I'm not sure how you feel. Um, maybe some of you are really excited because you don't have to go to school. I know my boys are. Um, maybe you're feeling a little sad because you don't get to see your friends every day or your teacher. Um, maybe you're a little bit scared because you've heard what's going on in the world and everyone's having to stay home and it sounds kind of scary. Maybe you're just kind of confused. What's going on? Things have changed. I'm not in school. I don't really know. Um, maybe you are kind of going, this is weird. One of my parents is now working from home. Everyone's home all the time. I don't know if I like this. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe I don't like it. And it's kind of weird. Oh, I kind of feel the same way. I have had to work from home here the last week and it's kind of strange. I miss not seeing my coworkers and not being at my desk and not doing the things that I normally do. And so it's kind of weird and kind of confusing and a little bit stressful. Well, there's, there's a story that's come to mind over the last week that I want to share with you because it's helped me and, and I thought it might help you. So I'm going to tell this story and then we'll do an exercise. I want to do an exercise with you and uh, we'll get back to, to Pastor Brad. So this story takes place a long time ago. And it's about three boys. And um, these three boys were about maybe 11 to 13, so maybe they're just a little bit older than you. And they were living at home with their, their families and their parents and their friends. And one day, an attacking army came in from another country. And they, went, they came and kidnapped them and took them back far away to another country called Babylon. Well, once they got there, they were moved into a palace. They, their names were changed. And they were taught a new language and they were taught all kinds of things and they were told to forget all about their old life, about their old family, their old friends, their old ways of life, their old values, and learn the new ways, new language, new names, new gods, new values, new people. They were probably feeling kind of like you might be feeling. Confused, scared, stressed, maybe a little excited that they get to live in a palace. There's a bonus, but probably feeling a little bit like you might be. Well, one day, the king, and I need to tell you about this king, he has anger management problems. You don't want to make him angry. He's kind of like the Hulk, except he doesn't turn big and green when he gets angry. He turns red and can kill you. I guess that's like the Hulk. Anyway, one day, the king has a bright idea. <clears throat> to build a statue. He's like, I'm going to build a statue. I'm going to build a golden statue. I'm going to build a huge golden statue of me. This is a good idea. So he has his workers build a huge statue that's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Then he has another idea. He calls together all of his advisors and the leaders of the whole country and tells them, when we play musical instruments, I want everyone in the whole country, doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter if they're visitors, doesn't matter where they're from or what they're doing, they have to stop when they hear the musical instruments and they need to bow down and worship my huge golden statue of me. So the leaders, they know the king, when he gets angry, you need to listen to him, so don't make him angry. So they're going, okay, we're gonna listen, we're gonna follow this instruction. The king also says, here's the consequence if you don't listen, I'm going to throw you into a huge fire if you don't listen. They get the picture. They send the word out and the musical instruments start to play. Everybody bows down to this huge statue, except for three guys, our three friends that we've been following. They don't. I'm sure their friends next to them who are bowing down look up and say, hey, what are you doing? You don't want to make him mad. You don't have to mean it. Just pretend, bow down. It, they will never know. But they refuse. The king finds out about it. And he calls the three in there. And he's trying to hold his anger in check. And he's like, maybe you guys didn't get the message. 
Maybe it was lost in translation. You're still learning the language. So I'm going to give you one more chance. You need to bow down when you hear the musical instruments. But if you don't, I am going to throw you into a fire. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Kind of scary, eh? Well, our three friends, they respond to the king. And they say, king, we don't need to defend ourselves to you. You asked what God would be able to rescue us from your power? The God we serve can rescue us if you throw us into the fire. But even if he doesn't, even if our God doesn't rescue us, we want you to know this, your majesty. We will never worship your gods. We will never bow down to your statue. Pretty bold, pretty brave. The king gets angry. And he loses it. He gets so angry that his face distorts. And he orders his soldiers to heat up the fire seven times hotter than normal. So really, really, really hot. And then he gets the strongest people in his army to tie up the three friends and throw them into the furnace. The furnace is so hot. The fire is so hot that the men who tied up these the boys to throw them in die because the fire is so hot and they get too close and they die throwing them in. Well, there's no chance for these three boys. They're there in their clothes, tied up, thrown right into the fire. The king sits back in his throne, getting ready to watch the show. He leans over to one of his advisors. Psst. Hey, how many did we throw into the fire again? And the advisor checks his clipboard. Um, sir, we threw in um, three. Yep, yeah, it, it was three. Then, how come I see four? He looks into the fire and he sees four people, not burning up, standing up, not tied up, walking around. And the fourth one, he says, looks like a god. So he gets as close as he can without burning, because those other guys died when they got too close. He gets as close to the fire as he can, and he says, Boys, come out, come out, come out. The boys come out. Everyone gathers around them because this is crazy. They should be dead. They gather around them, and not a hair on their head is singed. Their clothes don't, aren't burnt at all, and they don't even smell like smoke. And the king goes, oh my goodness, your God rescued you. I was wrong. Your God rescues. That was amazing. <clears throat> I want to do a little exercise with you right now. It's something that I've done and I found it really helpful. We're going to go into the story. You just heard it, so you'll just it'll be familiar but we're gonna use our imaginations and we're actually gonna go there and see things and smell things and feel things and taste things. Um, and it will help us understand what's going on and we're gonna meet someone and talk to them and, and, and find out some things. So I want you to close your eyes. And adults, you can do this too, uh, although the kids might do a better job at it because their imaginations are a little bit better than yours sometimes. So close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you are in Babylon. Do you see it? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it smell like? You feel the breeze on your skin? Look around. Do you see the palace? What does it look like? Do you see the king in the palace? What does he look like? What's he saying? Look around some more. Do you see the three boys that we talked about in our story? What are they wearing? What are they talking about? What do they look like? Look around some more. Do you see the statue? It's 90 feet tall. It'd be hard to miss. But it's twinkling. This is made of gold. What does it look like? Can you hear the instruments being played? What do they sound like? Do you see everybody bowing down to the statue? 
do you see the three boys not bowing down? Watch as the boys are taken in front of the king. Go there. Do you hear the king getting angry? What's he saying? Watch as the fire gets hotter. Can you feel the heat on your face? What does it feel like? What do you feel? Watch as the boys get thrown into the fire. What do you see? What's everybody doing? Now I want you to go into the fire with them. Don't be afraid. They didn't get burned. You won't either. Go in there with them. Now you can see the fourth person there with them. What's he saying to the boys? What are they doing? I want you to go up to that fourth person there. That person is Jesus. I want you to tell him how you're feeling. Right now with everything that's going on, what do you feel? If you're worried, if you're confused, if you're scared, if you're excited, tell him. Ask him what he wants you to know. What does he say to you? I'm going to stop it right there, but you can do that with any Bible story. You can find Jesus. He's there somewhere. And you can ask him and talk to him, and he'll talk to you through your imagination. He gave you your imagination, and he can talk to you through and in your imagination. I did this earlier as I was thinking about this story and I wanted to share with you, and I went up to Jesus and I said, what do you want me to know? And he said to me, he said, Stephen, I was with those boys even before the king saw me in the fire. I was with them when they got kidnapped from their homes. I was with them when they moved into the palace and were given new names. I was with them when they were taught a new language and told to forget all about their old ways and their old values and their old family and their old friends. I was with them when they were told to bow down to the statue. I was with them when they were brought before the king. And I was with them when they stood up and said to the king, we're not going to bow down. And I was with them when they were thrown into the furnace. And I'm still with them. And Stephen, I want you to know that I am with you. When you have to work from home now, I'm with you. When you don't know what's going to happen next, you don't know when things are going to go back to normal, I'm with you. It doesn't change the things that are going on necessarily. Like the boy said, our God can rescue us. God can change it. God can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we'll never bow down. Jesus told me, because I am with you. So I hope that that helps you. And I'm excited to, to talk to you again next week. And I'll try and plan some different things and some more things. Um, but thanks for listening to my story. And um, I hope that that helps. Have a great week. Hey, welcome to the second edition of Manifest Live. In this surreal thing that we call our new normal as we're going digital. It's crazy, right? I was talking to one of our manifestors the other day, messaging her, just checking in on them, just seeing how they're doing. And she said, I feel like I'm watching a movie. Have, have you felt like that in the last week or two? It's like, is this real? Is this going on? Is this actually happening? Because it can, it can feel pretty surreal, which led me to dig out this old classic. And I realized, oh my goodness, this is so relevant for today. So just enjoy this for a second. Is this real life? Nah, -uh -uh. stay in your seat. Uh Now, speaking of weirdness and is this real life, I had a dream. God actually spoke to me in a dream a couple of nights ago and gave me this beautiful picture that I want to share with you this morning because I really believe that this dream is shaping the way God wants us to see and navigate this crisis. So I'm going to share that with you. Hopefully it's encouraging to you. So in the dream, Shauna and I, my wife, we were in a car in a parking lot and the car was kind of idling. And behind us in the parking lot, there were hundreds of youth returning from a mission trip. They had been, I don't know where they were, but it was a beautiful reuniting kind of moment. I, I've led 
many mission trips in the past, five or six, seven of them, something like that. And one of my favorite parts of the mission trip is actually coming home and watching parents just crush their kids and hug them and there's tears and they missed you so much. And, and then Shauna and I in the car, we're looking at this and, and we're Go, looking at it from our own experience, because when you go on a mission trip, you get all filled up, you get charged, you come out on a high, you know, your walk with God, and then you have to re-enter normal life. And sometimes the transition can be a little weird, right? And so in the car, I can't remember who what it was in the dream. One of us, we were commenting, I, I sure hope that these kids are, are going to be transitioned well. Like we need to help them transition back into the regular world, now, when I woke up, I wrote down the dream and I started reflecting on it, praying about it. And God spoke some things to me that I want to share with you. Number one, this is how he wants us to view this crisis, this season, however long it is. He wants us to view it as a mission trip. And there are three reasons why. Number one is that when you go on a mission trip, I've led so many of them. The youth are like, oh, we're going to change the world. We're going to just, you know, what's good. And it's, it's actually the youth themselves that are changed most significantly. So the first thing that God wants us to know in this season is that we have an unprecedented opportunity to grow in our faith, to dig into the scripture, to have our faith purified. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And to emerge on the other side. This is the thing. I actually think we can emerge on the other side closer to God, more filled with faith and hope and love than we've ever been, if we're intentional about it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when you're on a mission trip, you actually do make a difference, whether it's building a house, whether it's, you know, running a vacation Bible school for kids or a kids club or something like that. You know what? It's it's crazy how much impact just a few kids trying to learn the language can make. And so we're going to talk about that probably next week and what that what that's all about in our new kind of topography here. We've got to figure this out. And the third thing about a mission trip is that re-entry really is important because you've been living in this different culture. And when you come back, you're not the same. And, and I just want to tell you, like, some of us are waiting for life to get back to normal. I don't think normal on the other side of this is going to be the same. When kids come back and parents give them a hug and it's so good to see you, they have to remember their kids are different now. And so as this thing moves through our system and our culture, I'll also be looking at, because I believe God is saying, Brad, make sure you do this. I'm going to be looking at how do we guide each other back into our new normal once we can all come out of our bat caves, right? So that's, that's something I wanted to share with you. And coming out of this, here's, here's the thought as I move into the rest of my message. Let's not waste this crisis. Let's not waste this crisis. So many times throughout human history, when crisis hits, people either turtle in and become selfish and preservationist and even start looking at each other adversarially, or they lay down their arms, lay down their guard, and lean in and just be good humans to each other. So let's not waste this crisis. It was at this point in my broadcast that I was going to tell you a story that I believed was true most of my life. I'm still going to share it with you because it has two meanings now. But the meaning, the story that I that I've been running with my whole life, and some of my Winkler friends, if you're tuning in, will like will like this. You'll laugh at this. But I, I think someone actually told me this, and I ran with it. And and maybe there's snicker. Some, you're probably watching right now, going, "He still believed that until recently." Yeah, I did. So here's the deal. I, I th always thought this town, or, or which is now a city, that I spent nine years with, with our family, Shauna and I, and I raised our kids there. It was great, great uh, season of our lives. I was always told this southern Manitoba town was founded by a guy named Valentine Winkler. Now, that's true, Valentine Winkler. But I was told that he was settling west, that he, was, he had his wagons and whatever he, else he had with him, and he was moving west, and he kind of hit this quagmire, this place where his wagons got stuck, and no matter what he could do, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't budge. So he finally just went, well, this looks like a good spot, and founded Winkler. That's, that's what I've been told. That's what I've been running with for 20 some years. Thank you so much for no one correcting me. What I found out is that's not true at all. He just, he lived in Morden and he decided to found Winkler and, and it's just, it's way different than I was told, which, which then proves the point that I'm trying to make here. 
in this season, in this season, we have to recognize that fluidity, fluidity is the key to the new normal. Okay, and, and that what I mean by that is it's the ability to change and adapt quickly um, and in and, and face of all the different things that are uh, mounting against us. So, so however solid we felt our lives were, fluidity is the new solidity. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. So I promised I would talk about during the week. But, but here's, here's the deal. What I was going to say about this, this story about Winkler was, so let's be really careful how we build, because it's not a great place to build. How many times do you have to build stuff on a marsh? You know, keep sinking and sinking and sinking and sinking. So we, let's make sure that we build a good foundation. Now, now the story is not true at all. But what is true about my experience of the story is I was building my understanding of Winkler and, and how it was founded on something that wasn't true. And so we need to get our brains and our lives and our hearts focused on building a foundation for our lives that's true. I'm going to share a scripture with you where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he shares this profound advice that is so critical for us in this time. He says this in Matthew 7, verse 24 and following. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. You can see the immediate implication for what we're facing right now. The question is, what have we built our lives on? Right now, I think you're you're probably you're probably uh, feeling a little uncertain about your foundations in your life right now. If you're anything like any other human on earth, right? The things that we have been putting our trust in that that should just be there, like the chairs underneath our butts, seem to be shifting. The things that should be working aren't working, and we're seeing now just how fragile. Our entire system, our entire way of life is things that we don't even think about that we've based our entire life on. Like the, the job security that we may have had is actually based on a system that is based on how things interact on a global scale. And now we're seeing all of that crumbling. We're watching jobs implode. We're watching restaurants shutter their doors. We're watching all kinds of layoffs and trimming back what is not absolutely necessary. All the things that we thought were secure in a matter of two weeks are, are literally shaking. And you may feel this. And I just want you to know this is, this is the message for you. Because any place, any place where we've put our trust in things that aren't sure, we are now being shaken. So if your inner peace depends on earthly things behaving themselves, you're building on sand. Let me just say that again. If your inner peace depends on earthly things, these structures and systems and jobs and, and finances and all, if you're building your inner peace and your security on that, you're building on sand. Jesus would say, the streams are rising, the floods are rising, the wind is, is coming at you, and the house is starting to come down because your foundation is not on the rock. Now, uh, conversely, he says that when our, when our foundation's on him and his words what he says to us, his message of hope, then it doesn't matter what comes at us. Now, what I'm not saying, what Jesus isn't saying, is that if you just have faith, you'll never lose your job. Like, I can't promise that our culture will be remotely the same as it is or as it was two weeks ago in a few months. Obviously, it's been changing by the day, sometimes by the hour. I can't promise you that no one you know is going to get sick or no one you know isn't going to die. I can't promise you any of that. Jesus doesn't promise any of that. What he promises us is that our lives, our, our spirit, our souls, our well-being, our sense of inner peace can be put somewhere solid that does not shake. And that somewhere is him. 
That's what we're talking about here today. So um, what, what I want to do in the next bit is I want to take you to another place in Scripture where one of Jesus' followers named Peter, you've probably heard of Peter, he, he was having a moment <laughs> trying to encourage a group of believers who are going, going through intense persecution. Intense persecution, and they were losing property, they were losing their jobs, they were being thrown in jail because of oppression of the empire that they lived in. So their system was turning against them. It was shifting under their feet. And this is how the Apostle Peter uh, encourages them. He starts his message, and this is uh, 1 Peter 1, and it's starting in verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, at first blush, you might think, oh, he's just going, dudes, like, or just, hey, how you doing? It's just the cultural greeting. It's the churchy way of saying, hey, hope you're doing well, bless you, or whatever. No, what he's talking about and what he's doing here is making a declaration over these people that actually carries power because it reminds them of who Jesus is and what he's done. So let's talk about these two words, grace and peace. When you hear the word grace, if you've grown up in church and you've heard pastors talk about it, you'll probably hear definitions like, grace is God's unmerited favor. And that's true. It is God's unmerited favor. But that's just describing God's disposition while he's giving us grace. It's not grace itself. Some some people may be talking about, well, grace is getting what we don't deserve, right? So it's getting God's unmerited favor. So it's unmerited, it's undeserved. And yes, grace is not deserved. You can never earn grace. But we still haven't defined what grace is. I love how Chris Vallotton puts it. He says, grace is the operational power of God. Now you can see this at work in places like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where Paul, one of another one of Jesus' followers, writes, he says, by grace you have been saved. In other words, grace is the how of heaven. I'll say it again. Grace is the how of heaven. It's how God gets things done, the operational power of God. It's the grace of God that empowers us to live lives we couldn't have lived any other way. So we, it dials us in to God's power. So just picture this. So these people that Peter is writing to, he starts by saying grace to you. And he says in abundance. Why, why abundance? Because I'm praying that God gives you so much grace, so much empowerment that you have more than you need. You've got enough so that you can actually look around in the middle of the most horrendous trial and you've got energy to help and empower other people. Isn't that good? Then, then there, there comes this word peace. Peace be yours in abundance. This is in the New Testament, so it's written in Greek. But this word peace here, which is where we get the name Irene, by the way, it's really that's that's really where it's come from. It's the New Testament equivalent of a word you've likely heard, whether you're a church person or not, and that's the word shalom. Shalom is the Jewish or the Hebrew word for peace. And it's a fantastic word. It's, it's an amazing word. Now, shalom does mean peace, but it means so much more than that. Uh, a guy named Brian Simmons, who worked on the Passion Translation of the Bible, this is what he says about shalom. He says shalom means much more than peace. He says it means wholeness, wellness, well-being, safe, happy, friendly, favor, completeness, to make peace peace offering, secure, to prosper, to be victorious. Are you getting the picture here? Okay, so to be content, tranquil, quiet, restful. Now, the interesting thing about Hebrew is not just a, an alphabet language. It's a pictographic uh, language. And so the pictographic symbols, in other words, the acronym created by the word shalom, um, the, the, the the characters are Shin, Lamed, Vav, and Mem. I've probably mispronounced them. They actually mean destroy authority binds chaos. In other words, destroy the authority that binds to chaos. The noun shalom, he says, is derived from the verbal root shalom, which means to restore, in the sense of replacing or providing what is needed in order to make someone or something whole and complete. 
So shalom is used to describe those of us who have been provided all that is needed to be whole and complete and break off all authority that would attempt to bind us to chaos. Let me just pause there. All right, drink break. Looking a little parched. So anyways, these two words are powerful. So when he says grace and peace to you and be, be yours in abundance, he's saying, oh my goodness, I pray that God empowers you to live through this time, that God enables you, and that he imparts to you this power that will break your connection, your binding to chaos so that you are set free to enjoy the life that God has for you. Is that not cool? I just love that. So then he goes on and he talks about what all this means. So he says this, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this is where this grace and peace come from. It's not just something I can work up inside of myself. It's not something I can earn. Again, it's grace, right? But this grace and peace, this empowerment to live with God's favor on my life, and then the power that sets me free from chaos and makes me a walking set free machine so I can also help others find freedom. This grace and peace comes from the death and resurrection of Jesus. The, the death of Jesus on the cross, in particular his resurrection that defeats our greatest enemy. And this is one we are starting to fear in North America for the very first time in a long time. Actual fear of death, fear of loss, all of this stuff. And this is what Jesus defeats. This is why Jesus says you need to build your life on me because regardless of what happens around you, regardless of how big your enemy is, regardless of how little your bank account is, no matter what's going on inside of you and swirling around you, you can live in shalom, you can live in peace, you can refuse to become part of the chaos that is gripping our world right now, and you can be empowered by God's grace to live in that day by day by day as your thoughts are transformed by the power of Christ. Ah, oh, that's so good. Okay. So basically he says, this is, this is another, this is another really cool part of our foundation. Okay. That's why our foundation on the rock doesn't shake when the streams rise and the winds blow, but there's even more to it here. So this is based on Jesus Christ rising from the dead. He says an into an inheritance. Listen, this is so good. That can never perish, spoil or fade or get sick or be lost this inheritance that we have in Christ. Look, and it's kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time. So basically what he's saying is you've got this peace and grace now that is that is something you can experience now. And even if everything under your, else under your feet in the physical realm comes unglued and undone, and we have incredible loss and grief, even then, the best is yet to come because our inheritance is in heaven and God himself is guarding it. Nobody can loot it. Nobody can steal it. Nobody can hoard it. Nobody can take it from us. It is waiting for us. And then he says, the key to all of this, as everything is in the, the Christian life, is faith. We are shielded through our faith. In other words, you can live in the midst of the same storm as somebody else who is freaking out and, and does not have shalom, does not have this grace, is not handling it well. You can live in that same moment, that same circumstance, and you are shielded, not from the physical harm necessarily, but you can be shielded from the things that rob you of that peace, rob you of that center, that shalom that God wants to give you. This is so good, guys. So good. Now, as we look at this, I want you to do some heart work. I want you to ask yourself, honestly, is my life built on the rock? Is my life 
built on the rock or is it built on sand? Well, here's, here's a, again, what I said earlier. If your inner peace depends on the things in the world behaving themselves, you've, you've built your life on sand and your anxiety levels and your struggles and your inner sense of angst is probably indicating that you've built on sand. If, on the other hand, the first place you go when you're faced with this crisis is leaning into Jesus and reminding yourself that he's got you in his hand and that you've got this inheritance that the best is yet to come, then you've probably built your house on the rock. Now, some of you, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, there's never been a better time. Like, why go through another day in this crisis with your foundation on sand? Why would you build your life on sand? Now, what some of us are going to do when our bank account fails or a job fails, we're just going to kind of move the target, right? We're just going to kind of move. We're going to try something else. So we're going to tune in online and we're going to go, well, maybe oh, I, what I've missed is this insight or I should have made that investment or I, I should or we just downsize our house and then we'll be secure. But but here's, it's kind of like, have you ever been to the beach as parents? And your kids are building sand castles. And, and, and kids with less experience, you know, they, they want to build their sand castles right at the edge, right where the waves are lapping up. They're trying to build. Every time a wave comes, it gets knocked down. They're so frustrated because they're building their, their house so close. Their hand sand castles so close to the waves, right? And, and so then, then they, they might go, oh, I'll move it back six inches. I'll build it here. And then the wave hits again and then they move it back. And they don't understand. God's going, please quit just moving a little further up the beach and start building on the rock. Okay, so don't just make adjustments to your life. This is the time to say, Jesus, I'm all in. You're the only thing that's solid in this world right now. And I need you. I need you. I need you. All right. So a another thing that I want to point out, just as we as we kind of move through this, is, is that what's happening here is that, again, things are being shaken. So there's a scripture in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament that talks about a time when God's voice shook the earth. And now he has promised, listen to this, um, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, Listen, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Why? For a God is a consuming fire. So this is, again, what's happening. Everything that can be shaken, it seems like, is being shaken. The only thing that can't be shaken is God on his throne. And when I'm connected to him, I become unshakable. See, God is doing something. He's trying to set us free from what can be shaken so that we can become unshakable in him. That's what's going on, regardless of what happens with the markets and who gets better and who doesn't. This is what God is trying to do in you and me. Now, if we've got our foundations on the rock, we know we're trusting Jesus, we might be tempted to think, okay, good, then I'm, I'm fine. Mission accomplished. Awesome, right? But actually, God has actually wanted to go deeper. Even if your foundation is on the rock, what he wants to do now, and this is what happens next in that first Peter passage I was reading, he actually wants to take your faith, even if it's on the foundation, and he wants to purify it. So, so even if we're basically trusting Jesus for our security, not our bank accounts, not that investment that might kick in later, not, no, Jesus, because he can't be shaken. Even if that's true, what he wants from us is he wants us to let him purify the faith that, he, that we have. And here he shifts, we're going to shift metaphors, and we're going to look at a smelting metaphor. So, basically, what well, Peter basically says, in this, in your inheritance, in the grace and peace that comes through Jesus and his resurrection, in this you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine. What may be proved genuine? Your faith. 
and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, if you're not familiar with this analogy, I'm going to explain it. If you are familiar, I'm going to explain it anyway. And, and the idea is that when you mine gold, it's mixed with all kinds of impurities. Paul says your faith is like that gold. It's awesome. It's beautiful. But it's intermingled with all kinds of things that aren't faith. Okay? So what happens in a trial is it's like a smelting furnace. It's like the, we putting the gold in, in the urn and we heat it up, heat it up, heat it up until it liquefies. Right? And then as it liquefies, what happens? Gold is one of the heaviest elements. So gold sinks, which means everything not gold rises to the surface. So our faith is what has substance. It's, it's the weighty part of our life, right? And God says, I want to separate that from the stuff that isn't faith. Your doubt, the, 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 the struggles that you're having, your fear, your anxiety, your condemnation, your frustration, all of those things. And so what happens is he, he lets the heat turn up in our lives. I'm not saying God's causing this. I'm saying in it, he's working and he allows the heat to purify us. So what's going to happen? is you're going to freak out. You're going you're gonna to realize, oh my goodness, I thought we had more money in the bank. And your heart's going to go, and you're, and you're going to feel it in your stomach, and you'll look at your bank account day by day, and, and, and suddenly you're going to realize, oh, something is rising to the surface. Fear is rising to the surface. And, and instead of feeling, oh, I'm so sorry, God, I'm such a terrible person, just go, no, thank you for showing me that. Because that's not faith. So yes, I would like you to take that and, and get rid of that because I don't want that now. So what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's frustration with people, whether it's, it's fear, anxiety, whether it's putting your foundation and your faith temporarily in the wrong things, all of that's going to surface. The ugly stuff is going to surface. God's not doing it because he wants to judge you. He's doing it to destroy the authority that binds you to chaos. And it comes in the form of these lies and these tendencies that we have to trust in other things, to draw life from other things, to get mad when we don't get it. And he's trying to set us free from those so that we can live with peace and joy. Is that good? That is so good. I think it's good. So um, what I want you to do is I want you to think about that. Think about your own foundation. Is it on Jesus? And then number two, I want you to think through What's emerging in me? What's surfacing that I don't like? Instead of just giving myself a pass, well, that's just because I'm stressed. Don't do that. Instead, say, oh, Jesus, thank you for showing me that. Please take that. I give that to you. I'm sorry for not trusting you in that area, but now you can set me free. So good. So good. So um, here's, here's what I'd like to do in this next bit as we just close. I want to encourage you to be commenting and, and helping each other with this, uh, this message as we're processing it now. And here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray for just a minute. I know this is kinda of awkward because I'm gonna close my eyes and you'll be looking at my forehead. I'll, I get it, maybe you should close your eyes too. Not a bad idea. But I wanna pray three different sections of a prayer. Number one, if you've never put your faith in Jesus before, I'm gonna help you do that. Number two, I'm gonna pray a prayer about your foundation. And number two, about purifying the faith that you do have so that it's like gold and it's refined in that fire, all right? So Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your grace and your peace. We ask for that right now. I just pray that whoever is listening, whoever's watching this video, would sense your grace and peace being offered to them through Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you earned that for us. You earned that by paying the price for us on the cross, that you paid for all our failures, all the things we need to be purified from. You, you even paid for our rebellion because we've been trying to live without you. So Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you that you died, but you, that you rose from the dead to give us new life. So if you've never given your life to Christ, this is what I want you to tell him right now. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for living my life without you. I'm sorry for building my foundation on things that cannot satisfy, things that can be shaken instead of you who can't be shaken. Jesus, thank you. So that's the first word. Sorry, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, rising from the dead to give me new life 
and forgiveness. And then please would you fill me, Jesus, with your spirit as I follow you from now on. Sorry, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And please, Jesus, help me to build my life on the rock. So those of us, Father, who have put our faith in you, sometimes we... Uh, we start putting trust in places that we shouldn't have put trust and now it's becoming obvious that we've done it because our anxiety is going up, our trust is being shaken, we're, we're lying up awake at night, we're frustrated, we're lashing out at people, we're hoarding things, some of us. Lord Jesus, we put our trust in the wrong things and we're sorry. But thank you that you died for that. Would you please lift that guilt and shame off of us and help us to trust you? from now on. And then thank you, Jesus, for the faith that we do have, but it's not perfect. We can see it now. Oh my goodness, we can see it in the way we respond to people and the way that we are frustrated or we snap or that we, we just all kinds of things. As our dark stuff comes up, Father, may we not live with shame or condemnation, but gratitude that you brought it up so that you can release us from it in Jesus' name. All right, that's it for today. I want to encourage you to hang out for a few minutes, spend some time with each other in the comment section, encouraging each other, sharing what you're learning, all that kind of stuff. Maybe if you've been wrestling with faith or you, you're thinking about giving your life to Jesus, comment that below. There are people below that will uh, engage with you. And again, if you haven't already, check the links below. Uh, make sure you take the time to upload, or sorry, download your copy of Go With The Flow, which will help you build a daily quiet time with God from scratch. That will be awesome. I tr Trust me, it's amazing. The comments that I've gotten from it over the years have been fantastic. And I'll also be posting some other links for things like a Bible study cheat sheet that will help you get started with Bible study because some of us, again, have lots of time on our hands. What better thing to do than to build our life on the rock by listening to words of Jesus. So have an amazing day. It's been great hanging out with you.